Hey guys, I've got another episode for you that was recorded live. So live on Fireside. And if you don't know what Fireside is, again, this is not sponsored or an ad. This is just an app that I've been using. It was created by Mark Cuban and I was invited as an early content creator to invite live studio audiences to watch me record my podcast live. So if you want to join along and like, I love that you're listening on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or iHeartRadio or wherever you're listening. But if you want to watch me record some of my episodes live, then jump on Fireside. So today's episode is with Alica Black. Oh my goodness, you guys. Her husband did not make it to her birth. And there's a whole long story as to why and how it went down. And I was her doula. So I can't wait for you to hear Alica's birth story. All right, let's do it. Let's get to it. What does a contraction feel like? How do I know if I'm in labor? And what does the day of labor look like? Wait, is this normal? Hey, I'm Heidi. My best friends call me Hydes. I'm a certified birth doula, host of this podcast, and author of Birth Story, an interactive pregnancy guidebook. I have supported hundreds of women through their labor and deliveries, and I believe every one of them and you deserves a microphone and a stage. So here we are. Listen each week to get answers to these tough questions. Birth Story, where we talk about pregnancy, labor, deliveries, where we tell our stories and share our feelings. And of course, chat about our favorite baby products and motherhood. And because I'm passionate about birth outcomes, you will hear from some of the top experts in labor and delivery. Whether you are pregnant, trying desperately to get pregnant, or you just love a good birth story, I hope you will stick around and be part of this birth story family. Hey, okay, Yay. here we are. Alga, I'm so excited to have you on the podcast today because we are talking about going into labor alone without your birth partner. So I don't want to totally spoil the whole thing, but I mean, that's essentially what we're talking about <laughs> today. And Alica crushed it. So you want to get started? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. I'm going to, because I'm your doula and I know all of the answers, I want this to still be authentic to everyone who's listening. And so I'm going to ask you questions that you know I know the answer to. So just, you know, roll with it. Let's start at the very, very beginning Tell us who you are. Where the heck are you from? What do you do? All the things that are special and unique about you, Alica. Uh, well, I'm Alica. I live in uh, south of Charlotte, so Charlotte area, North Carolina. Um, I'm an operations manager for a fire protection company. So I do a lot of random process-oriented things. Um, and I got into that from the Army. So... I'm an army veteran. I was a military police officer for four years. Uh, I went to the College of William and Mary in Virginia in Williamsburg, which is where all the reenactors are. If you're like from the Southeast, you've probably spent like a school trip there. Um, and I am married to my husband of six years, seven. I don't know. Something like that. <laughs> Joey. Uh, and we met in the army. Um, through a mutual friend and uh, we went paddle boarding together and I was better at it than him. And then he decided that uh, I was pretty cool. And a few years later, here we are. I feel like that's probably a giant risk of being male in the military and going after a woman in the military. Like there's a chance she can kick your ass <laughs> in all things, sports, Paddle boarding, running. I bet you can, you also outrun him. <laughs> I'm sure. I, well, I do now because I, you know, I'm a run, like I've, I've spent a lot of time on it. Um, if he want, if he like focused on it, um, he definitely would be a better runner than me because he's like naturally a good runner. Um, but yeah, it worked out because he was like not, he was just kind of like, I mean, sure, you're better this time, but give me like one more time and I bet I would beat you. And I'm like, 
hmm, I think I like you. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Okay. So you guys came to me through another one of your friends who were in the military, who I was their doula. And I think you guys had met in their living room. So yeah, we met in the living room and they were actually at our wedding. We kind of did like a mini elopement. Um, it was going to be, my sister and I were going to go on a girl's trip. And instead I said, Hey, do you mind if instead I get married? <laughs> <That's awesome. laughs> so Jamie and TJ, I think TJ was actually, um, our witness on, on the wedding, like on the, our marriage certificate and that's Jamie's husband. So I love it. Nice and easy. Okay. So before Jamie and TJ, did you know what a doula was? The only reference I knew was from Gilmore Girls, which, by the way, I'm wearing my Dragonfly in t-shirt. Um, You're amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and they had, a like, Suki had a doula for one of her babies, and she was this, like, really scary, imposing woman named Bruce. And, like, she was like, don't bother baby. And it was, like, kind of like this, oh, that's, like, so crunchy. I would, I would never do that. And then I started looking into it, and I'm like, I would definitely do that. <laughs> That is so funny. I mean, I guess <laughs> being a doula c can be crunchy. I mean, it can also be the total opposite of the opposite of that, like posh luxury, super rich and famous, <laughs> and then everyone oh, yeah. in between. Like, I think having a doula is for everyone. You know, I mean, I now that I have had like worked with a doula, every one of my pregnant friends, I'm like, you need a doula. <laughs> and <laughs> you need it right now. And I promise you, it, like, you just need one. Yes. Just trust me. <laughs> oh, well, I'm glad that you trusted Jamie and TJ and you hired us because I feel like in your story in particular, it was pretty critical that, yes. that you had a doula. Now, one of the things I remember, Alika, when we first met is that, we, you know, we tend to talk about like, do you want to have a medicated birth or an unmedicated birth or a wait and see attitude? And you had told me you are a superb athlete. So could you just share with everyone a little bit about your um, athletic performances? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't think I'm a superb athlete. Um, mm, I, uh, I am yeah. a runner. <laughs> And I like to do CrossFit. Um, so I, before getting pregnant, um, I had just completed my first 50K, um, which is 31, point, 31 miles. I did 31.68. Not that anyone's counting. Um, <laughs> but uh, that's yeah, a superb I, athlete, Alica. That's like exactly <laughs> what the definition of that is. <laughs> Most of us over here are on the app couch to 5K, and you're <laughs> like, I just did a 50K, no big deal. <laughs> and you, you still in your mind thought maybe it would be hard to have an unmedicated childbirth? I did, yes. Um, and I, I mean, I don't know if I'm getting ahead of myself, but like it, it was harder than any athletic event I've ever done. This is so interesting. You are getting ahead of yourself and we're going to get to that. But I want to break that down later because as someone who's not as athletic as you, an unmedicated birth to me was kind of easy, but yet I couldn't run 50, a uh, 50 K. So I want to, I want to break that down and, and maybe about how it unfolded and stuff. Okay. So you hired your doulas on the mm -hmm. love and trust of your friends, but let's back up. Let's talk about getting pregnant. What did, what was that journey like for you? So in summer of 2020, I was training for this big race, um, which is not conducive to getting pregnant. And Joe, like my husband, Joey and I decided like timing's good. Like, let's, let's go ahead and like come off birth control and just kind of see what happens. Um, and I knew I wasn't going to get pregnant during that training cycle, but I, I finished the race and, you know, just kind of the things that I use that were not just like, oh, we're just going to, you know, do the baby dance um, is like I did a modern fertility kit because I was really intrigued about my hormone levels. Mm -hmm. um, I did temp tracking with the the femometer um, and I did I think I did like progesterone cream or something. And who knows like what any of those things actually did, but it made me feel like I was kind of in control of the process, um, which will come as a total shock to you knowing my total personality. Shock. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but about, I think it took us five, five months to get pregnant and, um, it happened. Like I got pregnant after I, I had COVID around Thanksgiving of 2020. 
Um, so I couldn't taste any of Thanksgiving dinner. And I got pregnant when we were in quarantine together <laughs> from COVID. <laughs> How'd you get COVID? Do you know who you got it from? I'm pretty sure I was at the gym. Uh, okay. Not not okay. in a class, but I was like, <laughs> there was a, a very, very nice coach at the gym who was a close talker, even if you try to back up. And he was like talking to me. And then a few days later, he's like, you know, it's the weirdest thing. Like I got COVID the same time you did. And I'm like, you gave me COVID. <laughs> <laughs> uh, ding, 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 ding of like that tracking, you know. Well, I'm so excited that you meant it, mentioned modern fertility. I swear Afton Vetchery, who's the CEO, she gets like so much free advertising on my show because I'm just naturally a fan of this product. So can you talk a little bit about what that was like to do modern fertility? Yeah. So it was, um, the hardest part was the finger prick. Like the weirdest thing, like pricking your own finger to draw blood. It was like, it was hard to do it hard enough to like get it. It's weird. Like some like self-protective instinct. Um, but it was fascinating to me. What came back is that I think my, my TSH, so my hormone, um, thyroid levels were like just slightly outside optimal range. And I think everything else was good. Um, and I had a really interesting follow-up call, like with their fertility expert or whoever it was. Um, and I think on her recommendation, I talked to my doc about like, you know, TSH, what can I do to help with this? And looking back, I honestly think what I needed to do was just chill the F out for a while. Cause I was, I had just come off in a really intense training cycle. Work was really intense. Joey was going through like MBA recruiting. Like we had a lot of big stuff going on that was taking energy. And I was, I think I was just burnt out and needed to like relax. Um, and I think that's honestly what made the difference is that during COVID, like I couldn't run, couldn't lift. I just lay on the couch and like slept. And I think that's what my body honestly needed. Yeah. Uh, so just, I found that I did find it very interesting though. And I think it was very empowering. Um, because you're not taught about like your body as a, as a woman. And I found it very empowering to know more about that. So empowering. In fact, this episode that I had on the podcast that came out this Thursday, this last Thursday, and it was stuff you should know about your like tubes, ovaries, whatever. It's ridiculous how many times it's been downloaded. And I'm like, it's because we None of us know anything about our internal body parts. And I said it in the previous podcast, but that's because of the patriarchy, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so there are companies like Modern Fertility that are trying to teach us about our bodies <laughs> and mm -hmm. all of the things. So you come off of this really stressful season, you get COVID, you've done, you're doing all the things, like you're kind of trying to control what you can control. Mm -hmm. And then did you just see like... <gasps> I'm ovulating. Like what, how did that go down? Uh, I knew I was, I knew I was ovulating be like based on like my temperature tracking. Um, so the timing just kind of like worked out. Um, and then, so I have been like very attuned to my body in previous cycles to think like, okay, well I read all this stuff about like how you might be able to feel like, you know, you've got these cramps and you feel like your, your boobs feel heavy. And every cycle before I was like, oh, maybe this is it. But that I just knew like that cycle. I'm like, if I'm not pregnant right now, I will be shocked because it just it just felt different. I just knew like in my body that that it had happened. Um, and it's funny because I when during the quarantine, I did like a daily writing prompt. So I would do like some like free form poetry or whatever came to my brain. And I actually like looked back yesterday at some of that. And it was like, oh, I hope I'm pregnant. Like, I think I am. But you know, what if I'm not like I, it was just really interesting to look at that. Um, now, you know, so many, you know, a year later. Um, but yeah, I just felt like really heavy in my breasts and like, it just, I felt crampy, but not in a way that's normal. It's one of those things where like, you'll just, it just feels different. Yeah. I, not everyone experiences this, right? Right. But so, many of us do. I totally did. Like I knew the morning I was pregnant and I <laughs> Everyone is still like, you're crazy, including my ex, right? <laughs> but like we were sitting eating cheese grits and they just tasted weird. Like I was like, I don't know how to explain this, but like I was exactly those things. I was crampy. My breasts felt heavy and these 
and like my just taste this is like pre-covid y'all this is seven years ago so it wasn't like lose your taste and smell yeah. but like these cheese grits just tasted weird and I swear I felt conception like I just felt something unique going mm-hmm. on in my body and I wrote all about it too Alcott Believe it or not, seven years ago, I was also a runner, just not a 50 k but I did a lot of half marathons. Mm -hmm. And so I remember this is one of the telltale signs. I knew I was pregnant because I went out for a run that week and I could barely make it five miles because I had to pee. Like Mm -hmm. I kept, my bladder was contracting to the point where that my run was miserable. Did you ever experience that when you were running? Oh yeah. hundred percent. Um, especially early on, I think because I was so used to like my body being in this movement pattern that I've done for thousands of miles, even when like baby is so tiny, there's no way like there's a different weight. Yeah. I could already tell. And my heart rate, like I remember trying to do wall balls at the gym, like a workout. I'm pretty like, okay, I can do this. And I did like three and I'm like, that's it. I'm dead. Like, I'm just going to lie here. Cause like my heart rate went through the roof after like three wall balls. <laughs> yeah. It's so as our blood volume increases mm-hmm. and in fact doubles and our baseline heart rate, most of the time, by the time you get to full term, your baseline heart rate is around 90 to a hundred beats per minute. So it's a very high resting heart rate that changes. I mean, everything just starts to operate differently, even when our babies are a freaking chia seed you know, all the way through. It was hard at first, like adjusting to it. And then it's like my body settled. And then at like week 20, when it, I don't know, like something changed, running was hard again. I got a belly band and then I was able to run not far. I did like two miles a couple of times a week and worked out a couple of times a week all the way through literally to the day I went into labor. So it's definitely, um, what I would encourage anyone who who uses movement as like a form of expression or stress relief or loves to do it, keep doing it. Just, it might, you might just have to modify it and it will probably feel different through different phases. That's so true. I often get asked, how do I modify? And I never have an answer to that. It's always listen to your body. Your body will tell you exactly what your limit is and you just go to that and then you back off. Right. Yeah. So, and that changes day to day and week to week and definitely month to month throughout So aside, before we like jump forward to this incredible, fun, just (laughs) wild birth story, tell us about your pregnancy though. Like you stayed fit, but like, did you feel pretty good? Did you, were you tired, fatigued, nauseous, like any complications in your pregnancy? Uh, No complications. The first trimester, I just felt like garbage and it's hard to know what was lingering COVID effects and what was pregnancy. Um, since they kind of rolled right into each other. Um, First trimester, all I wanted to do was eat baked lays and drink smoothies. And I like the idea of food, like made me want to like throw up, like meat was disgusting, but I never had, like, I never vomited. I just felt low level gross for 14 weeks. (laughs) And then thank God it, it cleared up. And after that, I honestly felt pretty good. Um, I was sure to, I maintained a lot of like lower body strength work because my like lower back on the left side, I guess my sciatica, sciatic nerve there was a little tender and I had some like pubic bone pain. Um, But I went and saw a pelvic floor PT, which I will 10,000% recommend. In the same breath I say get a doula, I say go to a pelvic floor PT because it's again, so much knowledge about yourself and just so useful in terms of like birth and preparation and just knowing how everything works down there. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, And what it's supposed to feel like. Yeah. We need to know what our vaginas and everything feel like before, during, and after so that you know mm -hmm. when there's changes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How often did you go to pelvic floor PT? Uh, Before I had the baby, I think I went like three or four times. Um, You don't need to go a lot to get really good benefits. Um, A lot of it was like, here's how you can, like, here's your movement pattern. Be aware that what you're doing is this. Or like, when you bend down, like, bend down this way so that you don't, you know, basically like helping women preserve their strength and their, the integrity of their bodies when the movement patterns they have to do are hard. Like, 
no one tells you like pick up a baby there's an ergonomic way to pick up a baby that's not going to hurt like mom's back but that's not something that we're taught um so all that stuff was really good but apart from seeing her for some like you know minor s um was it uh spg simpsis pubic dysfunction that one yeah (laughs) apart from that i felt i felt really good um well, that yeah, SPD, it hurts. So besides pelvic floor, what are some other things that helped you with your SPD to feel better? Besides movement. delivery, just movement? Yeah. I mean, even if it was just getting out for, like walking was good, but honestly, if you can do any kind of strength work, like lower body, single leg strength work, it made me feel so much better. Um, and just stretching, staying hydrated but really just continuing to move. Cause when I tried to just, Oh, I'll just like lie on a heating pad and then I'll make it better. No. Mm -hmm. Um, also don't move when you are like 27 weeks pregnant or how pregnant was I? No, 20 (laughs) weeks pregnant. I don't know, but it sucked. And don't physically move houses. Yeah. We moved from Chicago to North Carolina. Just to add to the things that you do (laughs) this overachiever. So this is uh, real quick. It's funny being live because I have to take a sip of water. Oh yeah, I haven't I brought, trained I, myself I, to be live yet, so I'll just say that I'm gonna I'm gonna keep just doing the things I need to do, as, just like I know how to normally record a podcast. So, <laughs> so you did all the things, including move, and that probably exacerbated some some things with your SPD. I also yeah. want to interject right here. And I'm not sure as your doula if we talked about this at the time, hopefully. But there is an online company, um, a woman named Amy with Home Body Movement. And it's homebodymovement.com. And her Instagram is homebodymovement. She has a wonderful free masterclass on breath work. And just getting connected with your pelvic floor through breath through your diaphragm, through your lungs, through movement, um, movement and breath. So she's kind of like a movement and body and breath coach is the way I would describe her, preparing one's body for pregnancy. And then she has this wonderful online course outside of that free masterclass called Returning to Center. And it's all about like that breath work in the postpartum period. But Um, hearing you talk about like the things that worked like movement and going to pelvic floor in advance, like not everyone's in Charlotte, North Carolina or has insurance or has extra money or that kind of thing. So there's a lot of free resources online, like with home body movement is one of them. Um, another one I really love, um, is Nikki with the bell method and she's going to be on the podcast later this year too. Um, or earlier this year, I guess, in 2022. So um, I think those are good recommendations, Alika. Okay, now we're going to fast forward towards the, the month before, around 36 weeks. And I get a text message from you, or Colin and I, who are both Erdolas, and we get a text message about you losing your mucus plug after you like went for a race on the beach or something. I don't, I barely remember, but I just remember, well, I guess Alika's not going to go over her due date, (laughs) you know? So (laughs) what, what, where were you? What did you done? So I think I just went for like a, a run or a workout and a run is like, like, I'm sure like my husband like walked with me when I was running. Like that's, that's the pace we're doing. Um, but I'd done something and came back and had like, honestly, what looked like snot in my underwear. (laughs) So I sent it to you guys and I think it was 32 weeks. Um, and I remember that you said like, yes, that's your mucus plug, but stuff regenerates. So I was like, okay, cool. No worries. (laughs) Not going to worry about that. (laughs) So I, (laughs) I was still very much like, I'm a new mom, like first time mom. I'm not, there's no way I go early. I'll go full term. Meanwhile, your, your doulas are in the corner going, well, I wonder when, because it's usually, usually, like 32 weeks. I feel like you might have been a little bit further than that, but I don't quite remember yeah. because data shows that when your mucus plug comes out in like a chunk, we're usually 
delivery is usually within two weeks. Okay. Mm. So like, I mean, sometimes it can be longer than that, but when it's, when this is happening very early on, we're like, it tells us the cervix is shortening. The cervix is thinning because it's it's supposed to be thick and rock hard and holding all of that mucus plug in there. So when it starts to soften and thin in a face and starts to open, well, guess what? Shit comes out, right? So out comes the mucus plug. So the without doing a vaginal exam, Alica, your doulas are over here like, well, her cervix <laughs> is thin, short, and starting to open. And so, like, we hope she doesn't go into preterm labor, you know? And you kind of ish didn't. I mean, (laughs) mean, we'll get to that in a minute. So you didn't think anything of it. We told you mucus regenerates, which it does, just like when you blow your nose and then it's instantly filled with snot again. And you're like, how? Same thing with your mucus plug. As soon as it drops out your vagina into your underwear, it's back again. Okay. Yeah. It's, keeps I coming back. It off. Yeah. Did you see more big chunks of mucus plug over the next couple of weeks or did the remaining mucus plug stay up inside there? It stayed, it stayed until I actually went into labor. Um, okay. It was just one time. Okay. Well, the number one thing that people want to know is how did you know you were in labor? But we can't quite get to that question yet until we talk to them about the night before labor. So why don't you share about the the week leading up to your labor and your fears and anxieties and concerns and then what we were doing the night before? So the week leading up to labor, um, my husband had just started a brand new job and we had been to, like there was a trip to Chicago for training, meet some, you know, meet people, like network, get to know your new company. And he... Um, he honestly told his boss, like, you know what, my wife's really close to, like, I don't, I don't think I should go. I need to be here for her. And I, I told him like, look, I'm fine. I'm not going to go into labor. If something happens, like we have friends here, we've got the doulas, like nothing's going to happen. I don't feel labory. Like we're good. You, I really think you should go. It's going to be really good for, for you. And I just, it feels like the right decision. So he's like, okay. And it's Chicago. Like it's one direct flight away. It's a two hour flight. It's We figured even if I went into labor, he could get back before baby was born, just based on it not being like that far. Yeah, your doulas may have even told you that. Yeah, I think we all agreed like we're good. We can make it like even like worst case contingency planning. You're still going to be here when when baby arrives. Um, So we all agreed. He went to Chicago and was having, you know, a good trip. Um, I was doing my work thing. I work from home. Um, did a workout over lunch and then (laughs) that afternoon, like my lower back started hurting and I was like, huh, man, I guess I, I guess I overdid it. I need to scale back since I'm, I'm so close now. I need to be more careful. So I just figured I like tweaked my back. Um, and, uh, ended up that like the end of the day, I'm like, you know, I'm just kind of tired. I feel kind of weird. Like this backache like comes and go, I'm just going to lie down on the couch. So I lie down on the couch and then uh, we have our, our, do you want me to go talk about our, our prenatal? Yeah. Where you didn't mention any of these things. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I'm, I'm lying on the couch with this backache that's coming and going and I'm like oblivious, like, oh man, whatever. So I jump on the prenatal <laughs> with, with you and I don't think Colin was on it. I think it was us and my, and hu- my husband, Joey, he called in from Chicago. So we're talking through the plan. And my goal was to have an unmedicated birth with as few interventions as possible, um, to have informed consent before anything and everything else I I was fairly routine about. I didn't mind the vitamin K injection or the eye drops, anything like all that was fine by me. My main thing was not, um, because I listened to a lot of your podcast was not being stuck into the cycle of interventions like, oh, you need a membrane sweep. Oh, you need this. Oh, well, this isn't progressing. So you need Pitocin. Oh, you're on Pitocin. You should probably get an epidural. So I really wanted to labor at home for as long as possible with Joey watching Harry Potter. Like that was like my vision. (laughs) Um, And I wanted to have unmedicated and get to the hospital 
on the later side, but not, not too late just cause I didn't want to be in transition in the car. Um, <laughs> which is funny. Uh, so that was, that was the goal. I'm trying and to we remember were... now, was Colin at another birth? I think, yes, she, she was. She must have been. Was... Yeah. She was at another birth. Okay. I was, was like, somebody um, else was in labor. It, she's, I want to say, um, it's a, a gal who's a chiropractor within kind of the Charlotte. Oh, Lauren unit. Golden. Yes. She was yeah. at Lauren Golden's and Lauren Golden had a 52 hour birth. And so yes. she was at Lauren's. Yeah. I was like, there was a reason she wasn't on or available and it's because yeah. she was at another birth. Okay. So you guys, I need you to, I need this to really start framing up, right? Like Alica and I are on zoom because of mm-hmm. like COVID Colin's off at another birth. Joey's in Chicago and like none of us know that Alica has having back pain that's coming and going. We're like shooting the shit literally about Harry Potter and hanging out and early labor and like what their birth plan looks like. Mm-hmm. So I think I joked even right when we hung up and said yeah. like I the thing I shouldn't say like sometimes people go into labor when we hang up the phone. Well, we what. So I had said like, oh yeah, like I'm having some like back pain, but whatever. And we both laughed. We're like, oh yeah, whatever. That prodromal stuff, isn't it? Isn't it just such a <laughs> such a gas? Yeah. <laughs> and then your doula Heidi went to sleep. Yes, and I tried to go to sleep. So it was. I think we got off the phone at like I don't know eight or nine, and. I kind of puttered around, but I'm like, God, I just feel like shit. I'm, I'm, or sorry. I don't know if I can swear. I don't know either. I said lots of bad words on the first one and nobody dinged me. So whatever. All right, cool. So I'm like, I texted Joey like, okay, I I just feel like really bad. My back really hurts. I'm going to go to bed. Love you. Have, you know, talk to you later. Um, So I went and like laid down and tried to go to sleep and I'm lying there and I'm like, this really, like, this really hurts this really sucks. And I'm like, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna go to sleep. This is prodromal labor. When I wake up, it'll be gone. And that, that did not happen. What happened is I lay there and I got increasingly uncomfortable and I'm like, okay, all right. I know I can't really do a heating pad, but maybe if I do it on like the lowest setting with like a blanket between it, it'll just like help relax the muscles. So I tried that and it wasn't working. So I'm like, okay, not that this is real. Cause like, I'm not really in labor, but I'll listen to some Harry Potter because that's my comfort thing. And I'll get in the bathtub because Heidi says that's magical and it'll make everything better. And, and slow I got down. <laughs> it, should, it sometimes slows down your labor. And I, it did not, it did not feel better. Everything, I'm trying to remember like how to describe it. Essentially, if you think of like my lower back had these pulses of just very intense, like, like cramping or sensation and my hips felt like they were being like torn apart like if you've ever like done a really like tough aerobics workout or something and your hip muscles are kind of sore like that but dialed up and it never went away like even when the backache faded which was surprise a contraction um (laughs) they hit my hips still hurt and I'm like what the heck like I did not I did not sign up this is this is not what I read about Mm -hmm. like and it's we not rarely to- talk about that. Yeah. I mean, we yeah. rarely talk about with, and I will say, Alica, with athletes, especially who are, everything's kind of tight. Like when someone tells me they're a cyclist, I'm like, uh oh. You know what I mean? I'm like, can we lay off the Peloton for a little bit? <laughs> like before you give, because when everything's really tight, it's, opening with this hormone relaxant that starts surging and everything starts stretching and it can it can feel just like what you're describing like you're kind of being ripped open now now those those people that are more loose and limber and not have everything so tight and high you know maybe don't experience it but so you never got relief and newsflash everyone when you have back pain that means your baby is op which means they're facing your pubic bone instead of your tailbone. So there's a lot of work that has to be done to try to get a baby to rotate into um, a more manageable position, right? Like um, where labor doesn't hurt as bad, essentially. (laughs) So 
I mean, this is all happening really fast, though. We get off the phone at like nine. I'm, you know, we kind of laughed about this. You're trying to sleep. At what, when did you stop being in denial? Like at what hour in the middle of the night were you like, I think I'm in labor actually? I think 1230. Okay. Like around midnight, I think I had gotten up and I was, I was in the bathtub and I, I had a, I had an appointment with my doc at seven. Um, and I remember like I was in the tub and I got up, um, decided to get out and I think I had like put on underwear and I realized like I had bloody show and I'm like, Oh, this is real. Um, and before I even got into the tub, this is how much I was in denial. I went, I threw up like four times and then like got back in bed and I'm like, I'll just, this isn't happening. Oh (laughs) my gosh. And for you guys, I'm laughing hearing this because I wasn't part of any of this, right? (laughs) Like I was sound the F asleep. I just did my prenatal and went to bed. I had no idea that Alec was like on the bathroom floor throwing up with bloody show. What time did I get involved? I don't even really, someone else got, Colin must have gotten involved early in the middle of the night. Like, I don't know, like 1 a.m. I decided to call, I think I called you because I knew Colin was at a birth at around, like when I saw the bloody show, I think I called you guys. And part of like the calculus in my brain was like, this doesn't hurt that bad. Like, I've got time. This doesn't hurt that bad. Like, I don't want to, like, I don't want to wake anyone up. I don't want to make this real if it's not real. Um, But I think I called you because I knew that I wanted Joey to get on a plane. Um, And so I remember we talked, like, should we call him? And, And I think, like, we both agreed, like, Let's get him home, but he it'll be fine. He'll make the birth. Yeah. <laughs> but I do re- I do remember that being like, yeah, you have an appointment at seven o'clock in the morning. Why don't you just go ahead and tell him to get on that first flight home in the morning and like everything will be fine. So I remember thinking, I remember thinking maybe you were in labor, but maybe not. And yeah. You know, I always have a 24 hour time clock going, right? Like, okay, well, maybe Alica's in early labor. Great. She'll go to her appointment at seven. Joey will get home. We'll have labor tomorrow. You know, wonderful. So we hang up, right? Mm -hmm. And you get Joey on the phone. Yes. Well, I get him on the phone. I called him and he wasn't picking up. And I got worried that he had his do not disturb on. And I'm like, wow, we had a terrible, like, contingency communication plan here because I didn't, like, now I know that I, like, he has it set so I'm, like, I always get through. But at the time, I'm like, oh, no, like, what if he doesn't realize that I'm trying to call him? And I, I couldn't remember what hotel he was at, but I thought I remembered it. So I opened his, like, location on my phone and, like, <laughs> zoomed in and I'm like, oh, it's the JW Marriott. So I called their front desk and said, hi. I'm in labor. My husband's staying with you. Could you please like get me to his room phone? And they're like, oh, yes. <laughs> so I got through to him. He was very confused. Um, because he like, actually was on do not disturb. Like you weren't going to be able to get through on his cell phone. No, it turns out. So I, I, he has it set. So I can always call him. Like he'll always hear me, but he was fast asleep, which, you know, middle of the night. Um, Just slept right and- through it. I left him a voicemail first and he played it for me a couple weeks ago where it's like, hi, honey. Um, really like, I think I'm in labor. Do you think you could come home? Like hate to do this to you, but I think I'm in labor and he played it and, and we're both like, wow, just, I did not want it to be real. (laughs) How many weeks gestation were you? Uh, 37 weeks and three days, 37 and three. Okay. So five weeks after the big chunk of mucus plug, right? Mm -hmm. And then really no other pre-labor signs in between, right? I mean, looking back, I probably was having Braxton Hicks, but didn't think of, of, like, just didn't think anything of them. I expected it to be more painful, and it just, it was, like... Just wasn't. Just wasn't. So, So... I mean, my guess is that your cervix was thinning and effacing a lot prior to <laughs> one o'clock in the morning with your husband in Chicago. So you get him on the phone. 
I mean, now what's the plan? So what we discussed is basically he was like, all right, I, I need to call the airline. I think I, you know, basically like, I'm going to figure out, like, let me look at the app. Let me call them, figure this out. Um, and we're both like, okay, like, that's fine. Like, he's like, well, just, you know, do you want to stay on the line with me? And I'm like, uh, I'm okay. I'll call you. Like if, if I need, if I need you and keep me updated. Um, so he, we hang up, he starts looking at flights and things just like got more intense. Um, and also <laughs> earlier in the night, I had taken my evening primrose oil, which probably just sped things along, um, which vomiting that back up is deeply unpleasant. Just oh gonna... my gosh, because it's like oil. <laughs> oh, it's so gross. Um, I will never take that stuff ever again in my life. But yeah, he he's like, okay, I'm gonna figure this flight thing out. And then something changed and like, it just got real. And I was, the only way that I felt like I wasn't going to die was on my hands and knees and like on my floor. And I had a contraction app pulled up because he's like, honey, like you need to time these. Like I, I, we need to let the doulas know like what's going on. Cause I was texting with Colin, like, Hey Colin, like starting to feel a little more pressure. And she's like, okay, like how far apart? And I'm like, uh, I don't know. So I'm like timing these contractions and they're really starting to hurt. So I called Joey and I'm like, I, I need, like, I think I said, like, I just want someone to hold my hand. Like this, I did not sign up for this. This hurts so bad. So he's on the phone with me, just like basically using the language that we had talked about. And I took Melissa's childbirth class. So like, you know, breathe through it. You're doing a great job. Like I would not have survived without him on the phone. Like he was my lifeline. Yeah. Um, so and this is now probably like I'm trying to put my timeline together because somewhere in this timeline I get the a mayday call from Colin that says I like I like I just I don't exactly remember I just remember I was like I there's no time to go get Alica like I live an hour away from her like I want to- like 2 30 or 3 because I'm on the phone with Joey he's in an uber by the way um and headed <laughs> like, to he's the like, airport oh, hold on honey like, like hey how are you doing and I'm like he's like hey I, I have to just hang up real quick to get in the uber and I called him back I'm like I I have to be on the phone with you like I don't care if this uber guy hears me you know moaning I, I can't do this without you yeah. he's like okay yeah. like yep I'm here um and I think he called Colin because He's like, it's getting like, Alica's contractions are a lot like, he's like, we've been on the phone for eight minutes and you've had two contractions. So I'm going to call Colin. And I sort of remember him doing that. And I think at this time, yeah, Colin, like you got a call. And then it was like, I would just got really nervous that no one was going to be able to get to me. Yeah. So I was like, okay, what's the plan? Like, I don't think I can drive right now, which... Of course I could. <laughs> oh, oh my God. Okay. For uh, no, you guys, there is no such thing as driving in labor. Like that would be like way more dangerous than drinking and driving, drugging and driving. Like, no, you could not drive a car while you are in labor. Um, yeah, I don't rem- I'm trying to remember exactly. I just got a call from someone that was like, like Alica needs to get to the hospital now, but like, we don't know how to get her to the hospital. And I was like, well, and then I, and I remember someone saying like, there's no time for you to drive to her. So we somehow in the middle of the night made a decision that there was a local doula, Sabrina, who lived closer to you than any other doula and -hmm. could get to you the fastest. But I still, I didn't coordinate that. So Colin must have coordinated that. (laughs) Yeah, Colin, Colin's a champ. I don't know how, but Sabrina was called in. (laughs) (laughs) So the third doula comes in and pick swoops you up. So she, like, I think I was on the phone with, with my husband. I think Colin, like, had texted me and I'm like, okay, make sure you tell me when she's coming because we have, like, an aggressive dog. And I'm like, I have to put the dog up. So... I'm like, well, I don't want him to be uncomfortable. So I grab his dog bed and I'm like, oh, contraction. And I'm like, 
kind of paws on the floor and like, okay, it's over. <laughs> like throw his bed in there, put the dog in the room and the dogs are freaked out. They have, they're just like, I don't know what's happening, but I'm really scared. So I'm happy to just curl up on my bed. So I put him in the office and then like, I'm lying in the living room now, um, me and my pillow. <laughs> and like, <laughs> I open the front door for Sabrina. She comes in and, and I guess I was in the middle of a contraction. And I think you had just called me because you were like, how long have you been making those sounds? Sounds, Alex? yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I think the sounds I was making were, I don't know if they were guttural, but they were like, they were intense. It was involuntary, very just intense, like, whew, like, I don't know, exhalations just to get through the pain, like let's, to move let's through Let's do it. it for everybody. Do Let's do was, some. Come on, tell everybody what like, it sounds like to be in labor. I think, I'm trying to remember. It was like, whoo, kind of yeah. like that. Mm-hmm. But, yeah. But less pretty, less pretty. Or like this. <laughs> wah, <laughs> you know, like yeah. you lose your voice. Yep. Ah, like, wah. Yeah. By the time you can't, like, if you can breathe through it, you're fine, y'all. If you're like, ah, wah, <laughs> like time to go to the hospital. So yeah. all I, yeah, I know Sabrina got there and was like, oh my God, like we have to go to the hospital right now. We're going to have a baby in the car. Like Sabrina thought like there was no way we were going to make it to, to the hospital. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think I freaked her out a little bit. Um, and I realized like I didn't have a hospital bag packed at all, by the way. Um, <laughs> This so between better and better. I like like go to my closet and like grab a bag and I grab like some pajamas. I think I put on a bra. Um grab like my work phone, my normal phone, like a phone charger and some headphones because I'm like it might be a while. I probably want to listen to music. Um and like threw it all in a backpack. I remembered my insurance card. Um and then I was like okay, we can go now. I have my have my hospital bag. <laughs> What do you remember about Sabrina in this car ride? So I remember, I don't remember what Sabrina looks like, first of all. Um, I remember like she has this amazing calming voice where she's like, hi, like I'm Sabrina. I'm here. You're safe. And just like her voice, just like being this like, like washing over me, like, oh, thank God there's a human here who can like be with me. And like, I remember she put her hands on my back and it was just like, not that it took the pain away, but it was just like, oh, I'm not alone. Like, mm-hmm. someone's going to get me to the hospital. Like, it's going to be okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's what I remember most about her was her energy. Because I I don't remember what she looks like, what she was wearing, anything like that. I remember her energy was really calming um, and really reassuring. Like, I got you. We're going to we're going to take care of this. Um I remember I, I had a contraction on the, like the steps down to the car and I was like, well, I hope the neighbors aren't up because hello. <laughs> <laughs> it's like shaking the windows with the sounds. <laughs> the car ride, I was on the back seat on my hands and knees on the phone with you and with Joey, I think. Yep. I kind of remember where you were either going back and forth or, or not because I was talking to Joey also somehow. Yeah. I remember, I don't remember remember who was talking to who, but I think I was talking to Joey a little bit and then talking to you and he was talking to you and I was making my way to the hospital to meet, to just meet you like at the hospital. Cause that, if I live far to the left and Alica lives far to the right, you guys, the hospital would be in the middle of our two locations. So it was like, if Sabrina could just start driving towards the middle point, I started driving towards the middle point. I had a chance of making it to the birth. <laughs> but Sabrina was also calling me saying, you need to call the midwife, Heidi, because I don't know if we're going to make it. Hmm. And I was like, oh, God. Did you know that you were that close to delivery? No. No. Okay. Because no, I did I, call I, the midwife. <laughs> I remember, like, there was, like, a, there was, like, a crowd, um, I remember like in the car, like, like, I feel like I've been through some like shit, like painful things, like physically in my life, like through the army, through my like running and everything. But that car ride, probably the most miserable 24 minutes of my life. Cause like you're in a car, which is just 
you're in a car and like I maybe I think maybe I was in transition in the car, which was the opposite of my goal. Yeah, not think you definitely were in transition moving towards second stage pushing. Yeah. 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 So it was it was really painful. <laughs> um, just like continuing with like the back pain and it it felt lower like it I didn't feel like a strong urge to push but it started to feel like there's gonna be like I'm gonna have to push something soon it's gonna come out of me (laughs) yeah something's gonna come out soon ish yeah so I arrive at the hospital and the midwife and the nurse team decides based on um we put you on speaker you wouldn't remember this but based on your sounds that we would just go ahead and meet you in the parking lot, (laughs) just in case. So we were like still afraid at this point that we might not even get you upstairs to the hospital, but we did. Yep. What do you remember from, like, how did it feel to arrive at the hospital? Did you have any sense of relief? I felt, I was relieved. I was like, okay, I like whatever, like whatever happens now, I'm at the hospital, there's medical care, like it's okay. Like (laughs) we made it. (laughs) I remember being, I think, you know, I don't remember getting into a wheelchair, but I think I remember being, being in a wheelchair. I have this vivid memory of this random dude standing near the elevator with this look on his face, just like, oh shit. Like, whoa. (laughs) And you're like, do you want to be my husband for the next hour? Because he's still in Chicago. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And Joey is, I think, arguing with the flight agents at this stage to get on a flight. Yeah. Um, Which I was vaguely aware of, but not, it didn't, not really. Um, I instantly, the second I saw you, like embraced you, was like, I'm here, all the things, and then was like, how can I get Joey involved? And so I instantly had Joey on FaceTime from here on out. Mm-hmm. So we heard Joey coaching Alica, and then we heard Joey begging people to switch seats on airplanes, and then we heard Joey crying basically to the mean like airline who wouldn't change his ticket. Like, so we kind of, I would try to turn the volume down, like, you know, and then turn it back up when he was able to coach, but he was able to, you guys were locking eyes and making eye contact a lot through Mm -hmm. the phone, which was amazing. Like, yeah, I felt like Joey was in the room with us. I did too. I, I, I felt like he was there. Like he was with me when I was, pushing at home like he his voice was there like I felt I felt so supported um and then at the hospital with the FaceTime like yeah I I felt I felt his presence so strongly um and yeah I I mean I don't know if I want to jump it like jump ahead like we still have the pushing phase but yeah I felt just yeah I felt really connected to him even though he wasn't there um and it was I don't know it was really special yeah I remember um, the midwife and I and the nurse, everyone started bawling at the same time when we had to deliver the news to Joey that he wasn't going to make it. Like, and I think that came pretty quickly after your vaginal exam. (laughs) Yeah. I remember getting there and like you were there and it was again, like just like this warm, like wonderful energy of like support. Um, and they, they checked me and I, I had told Sabrina in the car, like, if I'm only like four centimeters, centimeters dilated, like I want, like, I want a refund because this hurts. <laughs> <laughs> and all the drugs to go on top of that refund. <laughs> and all the drugs. <laughs> um, but I was eight and a half with a bulging bag, I think. Thank God your water was intact because if that had broken at any point, we would have had that baby on your bathroom floor. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. So I remember I had like, I, what I remember after that is they wheeled me to the room Mm -hmm. and like, I think you guys, I think someone asked like, do you want an epidural? Like, do you want us to break your water? Like epidural could slow things down. And I was kind of like, no, like this is, we're on this train um, and we're not going to slow it down. So yeah, that's what felt right. And we just knew also you were so far progressed and she was so low, like, 
So we knew, we we knew like this baby's coming in the next probably hour at the most. And so we had to let Joey know, like, whether you get on that plane or not, you're not going to make it. And yeah. so we got to come to terms with that. Um, and I don't remember, like, I don't remember feeling, I think I had already accepted that. I think I just knew okay. he wasn't like, okay. it just, I didn't feel any great sadness over that. And it might've been like, I was just too focused in the moment. Like there's no time to feel sad, but I also, I didn't feel like I still felt connected to him. You know, I didn't feel like he's missing the birth. I just felt like he's not in this room, but he's present. Yeah. So we, so here you are not almost nine centimeters dilated about to push. We have this awareness that Joey is not going to make the birth. He's on FaceTime. And we know that there's this flight that's getting ready to leave that could get him here soon after the delivery of your daughter or like hours later. And so that kind of became this balance of tension in the room of like, you know, Alka, you were like, no, let's not get the epidural and slow it down. Like, let's just keep going unmedicated. I know Joey's going to miss the birth. It's going to be really sad, you know, but we were still like Joey was fighting really hard just to be there as soon as possible, you know, mm-hmm. to or to not miss or to just give in and just make sure he's going to watch the birth on FaceTime. Yeah. So once you've surrendered to what's going on, how did you get through the pushing phase, like what, how did you experience that? Like people always want to know, how do you know if you're in labor? Well, if you're at, if you're Alica, you don't, you know, you're <laughs> in denial, but like, how, what did it feel like to like, how did you know to push or what did that feel like to you? I remember you did like this double hip squeeze and it felt horrible. <laughs> um, and I was like, oh, that really hurts. Um, and you were like, okay, baby's head is like really low. And that kind of helped me understand like, oh, okay. Like this like baby is moving down. Cause like, I was convinced this baby was never going to come out. Like I was just always going to be in pain. <laughs> yeah. I think um, I said, if I can't do a double hip squeeze anymore, like you're about to have a baby. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I remember like I was, um, leaning on, like we had the back of the bed up and I was leaning against it and like resting my head on it between contractions. And I remember I kept apologizing because I was like, I cried the whole time, like from the time that like labor started until after the baby, like I just cried. And I just felt like, I'm like, I'm not supposed to be crying. Like I'm supposed to like, just be, I don't know, making noises, but I'm just like crying like a baby the whole time. And you told me like, stop apologizing. And then I was like, I'm so, (laughs) And the crying feels so good, though. It releases mm-hmm. oxytocin. It's such a release. It really progresses your labor, but it takes some people by surprise. Alec, I don't know this about you, about how emotional of a person you are, but like if someone is kind of not a person who cries all the time and isn't that sensitive, you know, to just easily crying labor can surprise you at how tearful you can get Mm -hmm. right yeah um often and I don't remember doing this in your birth but often I just did it last week I will say can you assign a word to those tears and I was with um Sierra last week and she was bawling and I was really worried that she was gonna assign a word to her tears like pain or suffering or can't do this because she was crying a lot. And I said, Sierra, what word would you assign to it? And she said, joy. And I said, oh, well then keep crying, you know? (laughs) Do you, do you remember, Alika, what your tears were about? Um, I honestly, I think it was like surprise at how intense it was um I had not I knew I understood like labor would hurt but I I never got ahead of the pain like I felt like I would be able to like ride with it and just sort of accept it and and I think to some extent I was able to do that but it it really took me aback how intense it hurt um 
And I, I don't want to like scare anyone or, or anything like that. You're not. Every story is unique. Did you see that Instagram the other day? I felt like I had tagged you in it or you sent it to me or something. And it was a guy sitting on the beach and he was holding his like windboard. And then all of a sudden he was like windsurfing like a second later. And it was like really <laughs> fast. Did you see that? Yeah, I thought okay. of myself. <laughs> yes. And somebody captioned it when labor just takes off or whatever. Yeah. Um, it is very hard to get ahead of it when you have a six hour active labor. Maybe yes. maybe even a four hour active labor. I mean, I don't know. Maybe what time was she know. born in the morning? Seven forty. Seven forty. And at one mm-hmm. o'clock in the morning you were saying you still weren't even totally sure you were in labor. And and when I I was I had I accepted it when I saw the bloody show and I knew I had thrown up and I'm, and the contractions were getting more intense. I accepted then that I was in labor. Yeah. Um but I didn't think it was going to progress as quickly as it did. Um I think even when Sabrina showed up, I I had no frame of reference. I was like I I mean I feel like like this is really intense, but maybe this is just how it is. Um I don't really know. <laughs> it's different um, for everybody. Sierra, who yeah. I was just talking about, her labor ended up being 40, 42 hours, you know? So some go really, really slow and some go really fast. And they can be scary and hard in different ways, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, well, you asked about pushing. What I remember about pushing, like, it was, it was hard, um, but it, contractions slowed down at that point. I, I was able to like rest my head in between. Um, and then I remember like, even in between, like, I just felt this like residual pain where honestly, I was like, I really want to get this baby out and it feels like she's never going to come out. Um, and at one point during a contraction, my water broke and I was like, what is that? And you're like, your water broke. <laughs> Yay, you know, now she's going to come and it's you're going to get that relief too. Yeah. And I think then things slowed down and I hadn't changed positions. So I like lay down on my side um, and like laid on my right side. And that's actually how I delivered. Um, and the midwives and the nurses were great. Like they didn't, they put in the IV port, um, but they did not ask me to move in any way. Like they... I don't know how they like acrobated around me to like check baby's heart rate. It was, it was great. Yeah. Um, so really fortunate. That midwife there. group is very lovely about body autonomy and um, adapting their skills to keep you as comfortable as possible. So, and we were all bawling because again, we're like, <laughs> you know, we're just, we're trying to like hold the phone and talk to Joey and like, and then can you let everybody know like what the grand finale of this is, right? Like we've got Joey at the airport begging people to get on. They're telling him he can't get on. The baby's coming, like kind of tell us what happened with Joey. So Joey's on, on FaceTime. I'm on my side, like final pushes, um, ring of fire, like push the baby out. I'm like, Oh my God, baby's crying. I'm crying. I look at Joey. He's crying. Like he's sitting in O'Hare airport like this so that people can't see like the phone screen with, (laughs) with me. And he's just like sobbing with tears coming down his face and I'm sobbing and like holding the baby. And it was, I mean, it was incredible. Like I'm tearing up just thinking about this moment of like, we just locked eyes. I'm just like, I love you. I just, I love you so much. Just like this total connection. And just being totally amazed that he's not here, but I like he was there um, and our baby's here. And then we all kind of like, oh, my goodness, <laughs> baby gets taken to do baby stuff. And like five minutes later, he's like, hey, Heidi, I've got a seat. I'm getting on the plane right now. And it was just like, no, ah! because it's like a 45 <laughs> minute flight. Yep. So we're like, boom, get here, like run off that plane and get here. Oh, it was, I mean, the fact that she was born right before he like got on that plane and was able, because if that plane had taken off, like he would have missed the birth, you know? Yeah. So he literally got to be there for all of it. It was really, 
It was really incredible. Like so many tears. And I did put the the phone into your vagina. I made him like he watched the whole thing. It was like <laughs> it was like lock eyes with Alica. Watch your baby be born. Lock eyes with Alica. Watch your baby be born. You know, I was like, I don't even know what he wants, but this is what we're doing here. You know, today. <laughs> um. Gosh, it was such an incredible birth. Okay, so now your friend Jamie comes, who I was her mm-hmm. doula too, because I was I called Jamie and was like, "Hey, we need like reinforcements over here. Like Joey's not here. Like she needs someone. I'm doing like the doula thing. You know, we got to get baby latched and all that kind of stuff." So, mm-hmm. oh, so Jamie came, and we're all just hanging out. It kind of felt like just fun, kind of girl time. Yeah, you know, and yeah, she brought. Um, she did bring you chicken leg. <laughs> Would you have chicken minis or something? Yeah, or chicken, chicken minis and like an iced coffee. <laughs> yes. I just remember you were in this little like jogger hoodie and you were just like sitting there laughing and smiling. And I was thinking, I don't think I could have ever done what she just did. I was just <laughs> in total awe, awe, like completely inspired by you in total awe, like not everyone could have done what you did with such joy and grace and strength and, you know, it, like at nine o'clock at night sitting on a prenatal, like whatever, seven o'clock in the morning, like barely make it to the hospital delivering baby. <laughs> Still in denial, you know, yeah. kind, kind of thing. Oh, it was unbelievable. Okay. So tell everybody her name. Uh, Valentine. Valentine Maeve Stamey. Valentine Maeve. I love it. And how much did she weigh? Seven pounds, three ounces. Can you believe that? For 37 weeks? That's huge. Yeah. How old is she now? Four months. Oh my gosh. Okay. So looking back, I know you said it was really hard. Like if you had to do it all over again, or like if you decide to ha- to go down the journey of more children, do you think that you'll just want an epidural next time? Or do you, yeah. did you like, at the end it was hard, but did you like that un- unmedicated power? Yeah, I, I felt so in tune um, with my body. Like it, I didn't, it's like these, in, I had these instincts I didn't even know I had. Um, and I, I wouldn't want to mute them. And I, I mean, saying that like it was very short for me and I, I totally understand when an epidural would, would be a good choice. But for me personally, even as intense as it was, like I, that was the experience. I look back at that as like, what an incredible experience. Um, like it, yeah, my husband wasn't there. It was the most painful thing I've ever experienced in my life. And I still loved it. It was still so powerful and empowering and like, joyful to me um because i i felt so loved and supported and so in tune with me like that was the birth that that fit me yeah i totally get all that my listeners on the podcast have heard me say it a million times like i i don't think i could have birthed max vaginally without an epidural it was just really long. He was 10 and a half pounds. He was sitting on this nerve. It was really hard. When I look back at Max's birth, I think about how hard it was. But Jagger, I birthed unmedicated. Like you said, nothing was muted, completely in tune. And when I think about his birth, like I don't think about pain at all. I think about pure power and joy. So if I had to do it all over again, which I can't because I just had my tubes tied, but I would definitely (laughs) do it unmedicated a thousand times over if I could. But, Mm -hmm. you know, if situations like Max's arise where labors are long and babies are big and they're in a weird position, you know, we have tools, but going unmedicated can be really, can be really cool. So there's this video, Alica, that I took of, um, it was about two hours later. Me and you and Jamie are all hanging out, and I get a text from Joey that says he's here, and he's about to walk in the door, and I stepped back into the corner and just hit record, Mm -hmm. and I'm, like, hoping maybe you'll let me share that on Instagram or something (laughs) someday, but you haven't seen it? Oh, my gosh. I mean, I'm sure we <laughs> sent it to you, but it was probably like in the middle of the, I'm going to resend it to you today. 
So I, I we have this video of Joey meeting Valentine for the first time, and Jamie and I were just bawling the whole time. What was it like when that hospital room door opened and you saw your husband? It was, I mean, I don't know. It's, um, if you just, if you've ever been separated from a loved one and you see them, it's just like, like a gold, like it's just love, like coming through the doorway, like this golden love where it's just like, oh, like my person is here. Yeah. Um, and it was, we were both like very like practical, rational people, pragmatic, not too like, I don't think we're too like ooey gooey, but it was just, I don't know. It's just this pure golden love that uh, just emanated from him coming in and like seeing her and obviously I'm getting choked up about it, but it was, it was incredible. Like the only other time I can think of that is like he deployed uh, for a couple months. And when he got home, it's just like this like pure release of love that if someone was like measuring my endorphins, it'd probably like jump off the charts just from like seeing like your person like walk through the door. Um, it was beautiful. And it felt, it felt so right. Like I don't, I don't feel anger or regret or sadness over how things happened. Um, I think they happened exactly how they were intended to. And, and I feel totally at peace with it. And I, I feel really joyful from that birth experience. Yeah. Well, because you're a veteran and because Joey's a veteran and so many of our active military are welcoming their children into the world and they are not physically present for it. I just feel like I would love it if you ended the episode with some encouragement for these women, um, whether they're active or not, you know, however that, that works out. But if these women are alone and they're either they are deployed or they're, are you deployed if you're super pregnant? No, no. no. You okay. Deployed. So if you were birthing alone, it would probably be because your partner was deployed. Yes. Right. Okay. So if you are birthing and you're in the military and your partner is deployed, right? Like what for me as the doula, it felt like it felt like he was there, you know, mm -hmm. but what advice or encouragement could you give if someone knows they're going into their birth and they're, they're going to have to do it without their person? Um, if they are able to FaceTime their person, wonderful. I know that's not always possible depending where they're deployed, um, communication, security, all that kind of thing. The next thing is that the beautiful thing about the military community is that the support is is unrivaled. Like there is another spouse who's gone through it. Um, love is love. Like whoever loves you wants to be there with you. So whoever makes you feel strong, you know, bring them along with you. Or if you are on your bedroom floor alone with your dogs, talk to whoever you can. And just for me, I, I just felt I had so much strength inside. And this was something that I had to do. Um, I, I've had the wonderful support of my doula and my husband. But at the end of the day, it's it's your journey as the birthing person. And it's something that you have the strength to do within you, whether or not you know you can tap into it. So I would say just just go inward and and seek out that vein of strength that you have as a military spouse you're stronger than you really know. You're amazing, Alika. Thank you so <laughs> much for being on the podcast today. And um, the last question I always ask everyone is what was your, what is or was your favorite baby product? So that if someone was, um, oh gosh, here, let me, this is live for you. I don't know how to turn <laughs> off the do not disturb. I, it lets call and break through. So you guys, that was Alika's other doula. Colin breaking through on this. But so anyway, now that my do not disturb allows Colin to get through, I'm gonna have to fix that when I'm live on Fireside. Um, but what is that your favorite baby product or mommy product? Like, so if someone's pregnant right now, you're like, don't forget to put this on your registry. Um, a portable white noise machine. Ooh, that's a great mm -hmm. one. Yeah, yeah. And there's apps are good, but it's great, like if you want to put the baby down, you put the little thing next to them, put it on their car seat. You get to use your phone. 
doesn't run out of like eight hours. It doesn't turn off. Um, like 20 bucks on Amazon. It's called the one I got is called like Hush with two H's. Totally worth it. Awesome. I'll link to it in the show notes. So Alika, thanks for being on today. And for everybody watching on Fireside, we appreciate you being in the audience. And this will broadcast out to all of the podcast players, unedited and live as well. So we'll talk to you soon, Alika. I hope that you enjoyed this week's episode. And before you go, I would love to see you in class at Birth Story Academy. Thank you for listening to Birth Story. My goal is you will walk away from each episode with a clear picture of how labor and delivery might go and that you will feel empowered by the end of your pregnancy to speak